So I think we should probably go ahead and get started. Uh, welcome to the, uh, the first uh, of the 2016 Building Simulation User Group meetings, PISA. Uh, we've got our very own uh, Damon Woods, who's a PhD candidate. Most of you have met him in, in one way or another. Um, he's doing some fantastic work, um, and his dissertation work is specifically on uh, radiant uh, heating and cooling systems. So today we'll venture off in the, the often neglected cooling side of uh, radiant systems. So, what, I guess a, a couple other uh, quickly. I'm lining up the rest of the speakers for the year. Uh, got a couple of interesting ones already sort of set up. One who does um, some great work with uh, uh, Diva for Rhino and uh, daylighting, and another one who is a Transys user, and he's got some lessons learned about Transys versus, versus uh, other simulation tools. Oh, I don't think we've had a, a Transys person here yet, so hopefully some good stuff. And still reaching out, at, uh, got a couple other ideas, so stay tuned and look forward to seeing more of you in the upcoming sessions. Oh, thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Elizabeth. Um, and thanks for everybody's time today. I really feel honored to be here. Um, so today, yeah, cold feet. Uh, no, no need to fear about radiant slab cooling systems when it comes to simulation. They can be complex, um, but I'll try and walk through a few of the principles uh, and kind of things that I've come across in my research. So today is really me standing on the shoulders of giants that have come before. Um, but it's a, it's a really exciting time to be doing this research as radiant systems are becoming uh, more and more. Uh, they're not quite mainstream, but in high performance buildings, uh, they're considered you know, a, a great way to achieve savings. Uh, and I'll be happy to take questions at the end of the lecture. Today's lecture should be about 45 minutes or so, but there should be uh, 10 to 15 minutes afterwards for a Q&A session. So if you have any interests that come up or questions, just note them down on the back of your paper, and, and I'll be sure to get to them at the end. Um, we'd also really like to thank Idaho Power, who's here, um, who's providing this lunch, uh, and, and this session, and um, anyway, it's just great to have them here. So today's roadmap, where we're headed. Um, the why, uh, why do radiant systems, what they kind of look like, uh, and then how to actually implement those systems and some lessons that I've learned in the past. I'm kind of just collecting, you know, the mountains of reading and books, hopefully into a 40 minute uh, overview of these systems that are helpful to you or at least in telling your clients about them. So in terms of motivations, I think there are three really good reasons to implement radiant systems. Um, the first is I really believe this has the greatest impact on the electric grid of any technology. Um, and I'll talk about why. The second is comfort. Radiant systems can really provide great comfort. And we can live in a net zero building that's a cave but, you know, we came out of the Lascaux cave, you know, a few millennia ago, so it's, it's kind of time to move on into buildings that use very little energy, but we don't sacrifice comfort in doing so. And the last reason to do these is just physics. Thermodynamics makes just a very compelling case to use water to move heat in and out of spaces as opposed to air. So in terms of the impact on the electric grid, this is the last couple decades of data from the Commercial Building Energy Consumption Survey. Uh, thankfully, the 2012 data is just out. Um, and you can see a couple of big changes. One is that we used a lot fewer computers in our offices in the 90s than we do today. So computers and plug loads have doubled. Uh, but lighting has uh, gone down by more than half as we've moved to more efficient fluorescence and even now LEDs. HVAC, though, and for HVAC, I'm including ventilation, heating, and cooling systems, grouping them all into one, it's still the majority energy user. And it's gone down a little bit, but there hasn't been this revolution 
the way there has been in lighting. And I think one of the main reasons for that is we're just limited by our approach. Um, if you're, we're kind of nearing the end of uh, Moore's law, if you will, in terms of efficiency of what we can do with air-based systems. And if we really want a revolution in minimizing our HVAC, we have to look towards radiant systems. Um, in terms of comfort, the way we feel comfortable humans uh, is really dominated by radiant systems. It's dominated by all the surface temperatures that are around you. So if you get into a car after a hot day, you're going to be sweating even if you have the air conditioner on because all the surfaces around you are still so hot. Um, eventually those surfaces are going to cool through convection um, and then you'll start to feel more comfortable. Um, but if what makes us feel comfortable is dominated by radiant systems, then let's, let's focus on that. Um, one way to measure that is, of course, operative temperature, which I'm sure is building simulation experts many of you are familiar with, but it's the average between your air temperature and your surface temperature. So for an air-based system, say it's in the winter uh, and you're heating, you're going to have a cold building uh, as you, know, you get uh, conduction out of your floor and out of your walls, and you're going to try and keep people comfortable by bringing in hot air through a, a VAV reheat or something like that. With the radiant system, we're flipping that narrative. Um, instead, we're keeping the surface temperatures quite warm so that instead of spending all this energy to heat the air coming in, um, we can get by with a much lower air temperature. And that's just uh, a more convenient way to do that thermodynamically, um, is that we change the temperature of the water um, as opposed to the air. Because water is just fantastic at conducting thermal energy. It's 800 times denser than air, and it has a heat capacity that's four times greater. Uh, so, you know, you're, you're transporting thousands of times more heat energy in a block of water than you are in a block of air, um, just because it is so dense and so conductive. Uh, in some sense, it, it seems pretty silly that the majority of our buildings are heated and cooled in such a, uh, a loose and uh, insulative, uh, you know, um, substance. So if, if we're to look at just a back of the envelope calculation, um, if you're trying to provide one ton of cooling at a 10 degree delta T, you know, this is not like a real system, this is just a first principles heat transfer problem. Uh, you can do that with either water or air. You can move that heat. But if you do it with air, you're going to need a huge column of air um, at over 1,000 CFM. And if you want to move that through your building, you're going to need a fan that is expensive, both in terms of financial costs as well as energy consumption. You can move that same amount of heat, uh, that, that one ton of cooling, by using a small flow rate, uh, two and a half gallons per minute of water, uh, and a low-cost pump, both in terms of energy and financial costs. So that's kind of where, it's, where some of the savings are in thermodynamics. Um, uh, other things that might come up from clients or your own doubts, um, that rating systems can be less comfortable or respond too slowly to gains. Uh, well, comfort is dominated by our surfaces. Um, H, uh, the air system plays a part of that, but not nearly as much as our surfaces. So radiant systems can be far more comfortable uh, if they're controlled properly. And I'll go over controls. Condensation doesn't have to be an issue. Um, it shouldn't be an issue in any properly sized and monitored system. You can have condensation in you know, a poorly designed VAV system as well. So it's all about design. In terms of expense, Yes, rating systems are definitely going to increase the cost of your structure. But you can recoup those savings by reducing your ductwork because you're only using your air for ventilation and not for heating or cooling. So you're reducing your fan sizing, all of your plant equipment. Um, and you can also increase your floor to floor height if you're in a multi-story setup because you need you know, less room for your ductwork uh, so you can actually get an extra story out of there 
um, by using radiant systems uh, through that ductwork minimization. You also just need to transport less fluid. There's, there's less of this volume transport issue. So smaller pumps as opposed to big fans. Um, and is it worth it? Uh, half of buildings that are pursuing net zero are using radiant systems because they're seeing an average of about 30% savings um, using radiant systems as opposed to air systems. Um, so for all of these reasons, you know, these, these systems are gaining a lot of prominence in high performance buildings. And that's, so that's kind of the end of, of my sales pitch. And many of you may be aware of it, but at least maybe it highlighted one or two things that you can present to clients um, or just have a better understanding in your own mind when pursuing these systems. But if we're going to be using them more, we need to start understanding them better. So I want to go over the, the system dynamics. The, the loads are different and the cooling rate is different. Um, and that's not an insignificant difference uh, between, between air systems. So if we're looking at the rate at which we're providing cooling to a space, Radiant systems have a very different profile. Uh, because they're not responding to convective gains, they're responding to temperature gains or radiative gains within your space. Radiation, of course, comes from people. We're all mini light bulbs standing here. Uh, it comes from actual light bulbs, from computers, uh, but most significantly from the sun. So you're in an office, you're sitting next to a window, the sun shines through, it hits your arm, you feel that immediately. But your thermostat doesn't. Your thermostat has to wait for that sun to warm up your desk, warm up the ground, uh, for there to be enough of a temperature differential so you begin to get convection and eventually your air temperature changes. By that time, you're already sweating in your hot window seat, right? The radiate uh, system, it, it also feels that solar gain immediately. But if you're controlling it based on the thermostat, it's going to respond way too late. Um, so that's just something that you need to keep in mind. They have a much higher and earlier uh, cooling rate peak than air systems do. Um, you know, an air system, the building could reach its peak cooling needs after everybody has gone home because so much of the radiant gains have built up in the space uh, that that can be an issue. So you've got an earlier peak which can be an advantage, actually. Um, it can be a blessing in disguise if your building's profile has a different energy signature than a typical building, so you're not necessarily paying peak prices from your utility. Um, just diving into this a little bit more, if we're looking at an air system here, we have both um, here in the stripe, this is your cooling load from convective heat gains, so hot air. Um, as opposed to from your radiative heat gains. And your peak's going to occur, you know, here in this example is about 6 p.m. Uh, and that's gonna, that cooling load is gonna slump off rather slowly. With your radiant system, uh, but your, um, forgive me, your, your cooling load from your convective heat gain can be taken care of pretty immediately by your air system but you've got a lot of radiant gains that are going to have a long lag. Um, your radiant system is the exact opposite. You can cut down <coughs> me, um, on your radiant gains pretty quickly, but your convective gains are going to last a long time. Um, so you're still going to have hot air in your space that are slowly warming up surfaces, so the radiant system will get to them, but it's going to be this lag the way that an air system can get to hot air pretty quickly, but it's going to take a long time to cool off any surfaces in your building. Um, there's an excellent article, um, and there are notes throughout this, um, and this presentation will be posted as a PDF on our YouTube site, our BSUG 2.0 um, site, with all the sources, um, so you can look them up and read them on your own, which I would recommend. Um, but um, there's an ASHRAE journal article, Cooling Load Differences Between Radiant and Air Systems. Um, and Dr. Bowman says, all radiant systems are quick to respond to changes in zone heat gains, but slow to respond to controlled signals. 
because they're talking different languages, right? They're not talking air temperature, they're talking surface temperature. So if we want to control them properly, we need to rethink how we're controlling those. They also have a different and higher peak. And does the higher peak mean that it takes more energy? Not at all. Um, we've got a slightly bigger cooling nail, so to speak, but thermodynamically, we've got a huge hammer that we can hit it with, with our radiant systems, because we can transport so much heat so quickly through this dense, conductive medium. Another way to think about it is um, lighting. Uh, if we were comparing an incandescent bulb to an LED bulb, we might be required to provide a little bit more light from an LED bulb, but we want to choose the LED bulb uh, because it's far more efficient at providing that lighting. Um, we're we're going to choose that over our incandescent every time. That's kind of the same situation as happening here. We need a little bit more cooling, but we can provide it way better with our radiant system. So in terms of kind of some, some guidelines, some rules of thumb, uh, a, a great resource is healthyheating.com. Um, there's a mechanical engineer that, that runs this. He's been cited a number of times in journal articles, so he's not just some kook out there. Um, McDonald is uh, a great guy. He's designed a number of these systems, and he has just kind of some general principles for getting your feet wet in these systems. And one of the, the most helpful is recommended surface temperatures. Now, he is not dropping his cooling surface slab below 63 degrees, um, and that's pretty standard. There's also this, um, for some light reading, lately I've been pouring through the Radiant Heating and Cooling Handbook um, by Watson and Chapman, uh, which is pretty, pretty helpful. Um, and they recommend a minimum surface temperature of 65 degrees. Um, so you're not talking freezing cold floors, right? Um, it's, it's pretty mild. Now, the surface temperature does not mean your loop temperature. It doesn't mean your water temperature, which can be in the 40 to 50 degree range. Um, so your water temperature is going to be 10 degrees colder than your surface temperature, um, but some of that's going to be you know lost through your conduction through through your radiant slab. In terms of sizing, you you want your delta T on your loop to be about at the five degree Fahrenheit range. So you're not looking for these huge delta Ts the way you would be in an air system where you've got 20 degree outside air and you need to ramp that up to like 80 degrees or something like that, which even with mixing just costs a lot in terms of energy. Um, with radiant systems, you just need very small changes in temperature, which leads to very small needs on your plant equipment. So you can use some pretty cheap, um, low-grade energy resources to do that, um, heat pumps being one of the main examples. Uh, the biggest fear of radiant cooling systems, condensation. It's very silly, but I just want to get this point home. There's no need to sweat it. If you have a good design, any design can be bad, but if you're keeping your floor temperatures pretty high, you, you shouldn't need to worry about that. Um, and the, the clearest demonstration I can give is to go back to your psychrometric charts. Um, I haven't been out of school all that long. I guess I'm still in school, so I'm pretty familiar with these, but it may have been a while since you know, you've seen one of these. Um, if we're looking at a pretty typical indoor air condition uh, where we've got an air temperature of 78 degrees Fahrenheit and a 20% relative humidity, our dew point um, following from our starting point is going to be at about 54 degrees Fahrenheit. Now, going back to our surface temperature, we shouldn't be getting below 63 degrees, right? So we're nowhere close to being in danger of condensation. Um, in terms of your controls, you can still provide a pretty decent offset, at least 2 degrees Fahrenheit from your uh, dew point temperature, and still provide a significant amount of cooling. Uh, another thing to think about, though, is floor coverings. You want to keep a, a good eye on the surface temperature of your slab. You don't want to be relying on your thermostat, uh, once again, it's just a thing. But if you ever have concerns or have a client that has a concern, run a design day 
and show this chart to them, um, or, or whatever chart is specific to your building, of your indoor conditions and <laughs> where your dew point is and where your radiant system actually should be operating. And of course, with a radiant system, <clears throat> excuse me, still getting over cold, or developing one, one of the two. Um, with a with a radiant system, I'm gonna have to collect myself here. Um, you're, we're talking about surface temperatures. People still need to breathe, so you're going to have to have some sort of air system. You're gonna need your ventilation, and you can start controlling your ventilation um, humidity. And by doing so, by having this dedicated outdoor system with some desiccants or uh, with other humidity controls, uh, you can significantly increase your capacity and lower your threat of any condensation occurring within your space. Some other control recommendations that I've come across in the literature is stretch your cooling demand or your cooling operation over a long period of time. I'm not talking about 24 hours constantly running. But if you think about an air system, um, most of the time it's just running during that eight hour occupied block. Uh, with a radiant system, if you expand that to 12 hours, uh, or maybe even a little bit beyond that, then you're going to <coughs> minimize your delta T's, right? Because if you're looking at your cooling capacity, it's a function of both your flow and your change in temperature. So if you have a larger volumetric flow by having that occur over a longer period of time, then you need a smaller change in your temperature, smaller chiller, smaller heat pump, um, it can save some energy. Um, as a general rule of thumb, uh, in terms of like air control systems, a radiant slab has a lag time of one to two hours per inch of concrete. Um, for best results, monitor both in slab temperature, so some sort of thermocouple that's just uh, poured straight into your concrete or attached on there with some insulation. Um, do that in addition to monitoring your air temperature or your control schemes. Thermocouples are cheap um, and, and they'll help out a lot. Um, there's a fascinating study uh, in Korea about different control operations produced by Dr. Lim and Dr. Joe, and they said that water temperature control is better than water flow control. So rather than having a variable speed pump with this constant temperature source, um, they found that having a variable temperature from some sort of heat pump or chiller uh, was a better way to control their systems. And they were controlling their systems based on the outdoor temperature, actually, which is an interesting way of doing things. Um, and once again, you want to limit your temperature difference from your uh, loop inlet to your loop outlet to three to five degrees Kelvin. Okay, so that's kind of the how. Um, or, and in terms of actually getting into simulations, you want to know what your simulation is doing and how it's doing it. Uh, and an important one is figuring out how it's actually calculating your cooling loads and cooling needs. There's two main, <clears throat> two, two dominant methods of calculating your heat transfer. One is the heat balance method and one is the radiant time series method. Heat balance method, super academic, goes back to first principles, very complex. The more I study these systems, the more I realize the heat transfer involved is, the equations are intense. Um, there's just so much going on because your heat transfer your cooling load is dependent on your temperature of your floor, and with an air system, it's typically assuming that your surface temperatures are constant, but you're gonna have these other internal loads, so how do you take them out? But with a radiant system, it's not only influencing the floor temperature, it's influencing your walls, um, even your ceiling a little bit, as conduction is occurring in addition to convection um, and radiation, of course as you know, your radiant energy is going directly into the slab. So because there are three different modes of heat transfer involved, uh, the, the equations are, are quite complex, and these kind of take that into account. There are some things that are still left out, 
Um, some things are still lacking using the heat balance method, like your solar gains from your windows. But they're far better than the radiant time series method, which is simply an, appro excuse me, an approximation. Um, this is kind of saying, well, generally, we're looking at this time lag, and let's use some transfer functions to generally approximate the behavior. But if you're going to be doing um, any sizing based on a simulation program, you want something that has the mathematical rigor to actually handle it. Um, so those that do include ESPER, Transys, IES, and Energy Plus. Um, with eQuest and DO2, you kind of have to trick these simulations a little bit by commanding uh, surface temperatures to follow a particular schedule or something like that. Uh, you're going to miss a lot of the dynamics that are captured in the heat balance method. So in terms of implementation, I'll kind of walk through how to set one of these systems up in Open Studio. Open Studio being the front end to Energy Plus. It's not as mature as Energy Plus. Um, there are some features that Energy Plus has that Open Studio has yet to catch up on, but it is a graphic user interface. So you can drag and drop your different components as opposed to Energy Plus, which is a massive text editor, right? And after a while, my eyes just kind of glaze over looking at Energy Plus. Um, you still kind of need to go back into the text editor sometimes with Open Studio, but I like using this as a starting point. And I'll walk through just kind of a, a basic example. So when you open Open Studio, uh, which is running on Energy Plus, uh, you go to your HVAC loops and you create a new plant loop. Pretty straightforward, which has two sides to it, your supply equipment and your demand equipment. So in terms of your supply side equipment, what you're going to be using, of course, would be chillers, cooling towers, heat pumps. Um, chillers, of course, have a very high capacity, and they can deliver a very low service water temperature. But you don't necessarily need that for radiant systems. Um, for a cooling tower, it's great in Boise because we have a very dry climate, so you can get a lot of gain by taking it down to that dew point. And it's really tough, I would say almost impossible, to have any condensation issues if your only cooling system is a cooling tower. Um, because, of course, you can only take it down to that dew point, and through the losses, you're going to end up with a couple degrees higher in your slab uh, than your actual air dew point. So, You've got low risk of condensation, it's good for dry climates, but it might not be able to get your temperature quite as low as you want it in every condition. Uh, so you could even combine a cooling tower with a heat pump. I know there are some buildings here in Boise that have done that. Um, it, heat pumps are just great to pair with other systems. Uh, so that's kind of the, the supply side equipment. So you're going to have a library over here on your right. I apologize for cutting that off. But you can just drag and drop your equipment in. You can drag in a pump give it a particular size, your chiller, um, your set point, so what the temperature should be coming out of that, and be sure to add uh, an adiabatic pipe bypass so you're not forcing the water through the chiller every time when you don't need it. You also want to set up uh, a dual set point manager here um, with, a, with a dead band, and you can kind of set the, the loop temperatures um, as, as you desire. They come with recommendations. Um, particularly when you uh, implement a radiant system, uh, which are, are a good starting point. So looking down, um, down below here at the demand equipment, uh, would be your surfaces that you're cooling with your radiant equipment. So this could be a, a poured-in concrete slab, uh, or it could be you know uh, pipes uh, attached to metal fins um, directly under. Uh, like a wood panel system. So this has a much lower thermal mass, faster response time. Um, this has the slab kind of has a lot of that thermal massing ability, so it's going to be very slow to change in temperatures. Um, advantages and disadvantages to each. So to start creating that demand side equipment, you're going to go into your Open Studio, and you're actually going to begin to, by defining the actual surface that is going to be uh, have a radiant system attached to it. 
So you just drag in your, um, say, insulation or your concrete, but you have to create this internal source construction. Otherwise, Open Studio won't recognize it. It can't just be any sort of um, typical construction. You have to use an internal source construction. So that's just something to be aware of in Open Studio. Um, and then, and you want to assign those surfaces to the particular zone that you're controlling. So then you go into your zones, uh, and you have a library, and they have radiant variable flow or constant flow. So I just dragged and dropped this low temp radiant constant flow into my zone equipment. Um, and this is where you can begin applying your different settings. So look at its availability schedule. Do you want this system available to operate at night? Do you want it to operate only at night or only during particular parts of the day? Um, your surface type, this could be a floor, ceiling, panel, or a wall. Um, define your, you know, tubing circuit uh, and its and its particular dynamics. You don't want to have an inner diameter much above half an inch, um, is is what I found. And then look at your temperature control type. Uh, this can be your mean air temperature. It can be the outdoor temperature, um, or just the uh, zone air dry bulb or wet bulb temperature. I would highly recommend using the mean air temperature. Um, system, you can then look at your cooling coil. Um, there's also a heating coil, but today I'm kind of just focusing on cooling. And this is where you'll see those recommended uh, loop temperatures for your high and low set points, as well as your air temperature set points that you're controlling it based off of. And particularly important is your condensation control dew point offset. Um, because you don't want to be taking your surface temperature, you know, right down to that, that dew point. You want to avoid condensation. So you've got this offset option where it will immediately uh, shut off as soon as it reaches that temperature. Um, then you can define your loop association. So this was the settings tab that we were just looking at. And now you want to figure out, okay, I've got this radiant a surface defined where should this go on your demand side. So you just pop it up in your radiant plant loop and it appears where we had put our chiller and everything else. Um, so you go back to your loops tab, uh, set it up here, make sure you also have a bypass and you can verify that it has the same set points as settings as earlier. You can change them either here or in your zones tab. So some that's a very basic system. You can start getting pretty wild with some water to water heat pumps, adding cooling towers, um, all sorts of things. But that's the, the basic building blocks. Um, There's some great tutorials out of uh, NREL on their Open Studio YouTube site actually, um, as well as Unmet Hours is a really great resource. As you begin adding complexity to these loops, um, there are some great examples on, on their website of you know, what these loops look like in the Open Studio interface. Things that I've kind of come across as, as I've been trying to simulate these systems is you want to make sure that you have accurate ground temperatures when you're dealing with slab systems. Uh, you also want to double check everything. Um, your node temperatures, flows, and when it's changing over from heating to cooling. Um, I'm talking mostly about cooling, but Typically, radiant systems have been used in the past for heating. You can use them for both, but you want to make sure that you're not swapping from heating to cooling within the same day because you've got this huge thermal mass. The changeover events should be rare. Um, they should be pretty much seasonal. Uh, so you're changing over to cooling sometime in the spring, and you're changing back over to heating sometime in October. Now, you can have changeovers more regularly than that, but they definitely shouldn't be on a regular daily basis. And you can verify that um, in, in your simulation. You also want to look at the priorities of your equipment. Um, Energy Plus uses the term priorities. I think Open Studio uses the term sequence. But you want to make sure that it's calling on your radiant system to meet the demand first, and then your air system. Uh, so for ground temperature accuracy, 
Energy Plus has this great tool, um, and it kind of does a pre-run of your actual simulation to just assess how your ground temperature in whatever climate zone you load is going to change throughout the year. This isn't available directly in the Open Studio interface, but you can do this through running a measure. Um, the Advanced Energy De Design Guide option um, has this uh, slab and basement um, option. So all you have to do is basically drag and drop this in. Um, make sure that you select slab and your climate type. Um, and that's going to, oh, here's a, here's a better zoom in of that. Uh, that's going to just allow for more accurate heat transfer calculations when you're dealing with slab systems. If you want to add even uh, more uh, verification, I guess, um, be, be more confident in your results. Uh, and this is something I just recently learned from the, the Big Ladder software group, is that you can run multiple rounds of your simulation. So you actually run your simulation, say, for four years. It's running the same weather period four times over. So your simulation is going to take four times as long. So you're not going to be wanting to do this every single time. But what that does is because the ground temperatures change so slowly and can pay, take so much time to actually calculate those things, um, that it might not be initially accurate. You might have this initial, con, initial value problem where it's not sure where it should be to start. So you want to run your simulation through a few different cycles so that by the third or fourth year, you're actually getting the accurate temperature profile for your slab system. Um, this is not available in the Open Studio straight graphic user interface. So what you have to do is you have to open your OSM file that's produced in a text editor and go into your run period and just um, add this to change this, which defaults to one, change it to three or four. And then when you're looking at your Open Studio results, it'll show just that last year's worth of data that you've run. Um, when you're running it in Energy Plus, it's going to show you all four years. So you just have to scroll down and then look at the last year's worth of data and delete the earlier years. So just another sanity check um, for highly detailed calculations. You also want to check your node temperatures and your node flows. You want to make sure that you're not running your water through your bypass all the time and that your simulation isn't engaging your ch chiller and that it's providing the correct inlet and outlet temperatures so you don't have this really wide difference uh, in your uh, delta T, basically. Um, so you can just click on any of these and name them and then run another Energy Plus measure. Um, you can Google how to do that or, or look on unmet hours, but add a measure to report certain nodes uh, and it's much easier than knowing like node 97 or node 82. Actually just go in and type in a new name for these of chiller outlet, radiant cooling slab inlet. Uh, so that way you can find them pretty quickly and then monitor them. You want to be paying attention to those to make sure that your radiant system is operating correctly. Um, the last piece, uh, this is something that Amir uh, taught me as well. Where's Amir? Oh, there's. Um, you want to look at your priorities. So you're, you're not having solely your, your radiant system. You also need an air system. And when you have both of these in one zone, it's going to look for which one it should use for heating or cooling first. And you want to make sure that it, in its sequence, it's looking to the radiant system first. If it's looking to the radiant system second, then it's going to just size a massive or just conventional air side system and never turn on your radiant panels unless somehow your air system can't keep up with the internal demands. What you want to do is size your radiant system and then have your air system kick in as a second priority whenever your cooling loads can't be met with your radiant system alone. But um, this is, once again, just opening your OSM in a text editor and looking at your zone HVAC equipment list um, just to make sure that your radiant system is going to be used and not forgotten along the way. Um, other specific simulation notes that have come across uh, it would be great 
because radiant systems are so hard to size, um, you know, looking looking through this, the authors pretty much conclude it's very complex. We hope Energy Plus gets better. Um, and this was in 2002, so it has gotten a lot better. Um, and there's there's far more users, but you really need a comprehensive approach to sizing these systems. But when you're running Energy Plus, you wish you could just click the auto size feature, um, which works great for air systems, but it actually develops for its sizing uh, its cooling load calculations from an ideal air system. So this is just an air system that operates with 100% efficiency, does not take into account the surface temperatures and things like that, which you need to consider for your radiant system. So Energy Plus is capable of all of these correct calculations, but you need to, you know, starting with an auto size is a great place to start, but then you actually need to adjust your design parameters within it and hard size those systems to ensure that you're not getting condensation, uh, you're not leaving people roasting in your office, you know. Um, so just something to be aware of, that Energy Plus can do all of these calculations, but you want to, you don't want to rely on the auto size and spit out, oh, this should be the size of my chiller. Start with that and then look at your unmet hours, look at your chiller sizing, adjust it up and down a little bit through the hard sizing as opposed to just relying on the defaults um, because the, the defaults rely on an air system. The other thing is that when you're looking at providing heating or cooling through like a district air system or an ideal air loads, uh, I, I was tearing my hair out because I ran the simulation and I had the plug loads and the lighting just perfect. And I've got a real building and it's got heating and cooling um, in there as well. But as soon as I added just an ideal air system, the the energy use index was just off the charts high. I was like, why is that? An ideal air system should be 100% efficient, or a district energy system should be 100% efficient, which it is, but remember when you're ever you're using a heat pump, you're actually getting better than 100% efficiency. Um, because, of course, you're not getting you know better than the laws of physics, but you're using less electrical energy um, and the environmental conditions to produce larger thermal um, changes within your space. So if you have a heat pump or a chiller with a coefficient of performance in the four or five range, your um, energy in use index or your energy total should go down from your ideal system. So don't think of your ideal air system as being, oh, here's where I start and it's only going to go up from here. Um, you can actually go down quite a bit by employing heat pumps and other, you know, refrigeration equipment. So uh, the other thing to note is what I found helpful uh, when I model a system is I try just an air side system first. I try a typical VAV um, and then I add my radiant system in after that. If my energy use goes up, then I've probably got an issue um, where it's the um, radiant system is cooling the space so much that the VAV terminals are going to kick in and bring in hot air because it thinks the space is too cold. And so you're going to have the two of them fighting each other, and of course that's never good. So that's why you monitor your node temperatures, uh, your availability schedules, and your plant sizing. Um, the, the last thing that I want to just note is that you can use these radiant cooling systems anywhere. Um, they're not just pie in the sky, uh, they're being implemented, and it's not just uh, simulation only, um, academic ivory tower nerds like me, like they're actually getting built. Um, and just to see how effective they would be, there's this great, uh, great ASHRAE feature on this building, uh, which is in India, and they split this completely in half because they wanted to build more campuses like this, and they wanted to know if it was more efficient to go with um, a state-of-the-art VAV system or a radiant system along with a dedicated outdoor air system. So half radiant, half, half air system. Um, what they found uh, is that even though it is swelteringly hot um, in this particular location, where a peak temperature of 115 degrees Fahrenheit 
and a whole lot of humidity, um, they were still able to implement the system and see close to a 30% savings uh, in their HVAC system usage. Um, their chillers were smaller. Their pumps, they did use more pumping power, um, but your air handling equipment is just so much smaller because you're only using it for ventilation, not for moving heat or cool through your building through this very inefficient, um, not particularly dense medium. And most importantly, people were way more comfortable in the radiant side of system than they were uh, given in the air system. So these were actual results um, of occupant surveys. Um, but even in simulations, you really want to look at your PMV, uh, your predictive mean vote, uh, is one output variable you can generate from your reports uh, in Energy Plus or Open Studio, as well as your unmet hours. So don't look just at unmet hours, but if you're comparing two different systems and you want to present your client with the advantages or disadvantages of them, uh, look at how happy people are going to be in your system. If it's a well-controlled radiant system, your predictive mean vote should be on the satisfied end of things. Um, if, it's, if it's a poorly controlled system, then you need to go back and do some investigation in your nodes, your availability, and look at your system operation and how you're controlling it. Um, just a few other resources, like I said, standing on the shoulders of giants. Um, Olsen um, is a researcher out of Norway, I believe, um, Northern Europe at least, um, and he's developed uh, a number of papers on dimensioning and sizing of radiant heating and cooling systems. Uh, McDonald runs uh, the healthyheating.com, uh, um, and <coughs> excuse me, particularly uh, I've been uh, really appreciative of uh, Dr. Dove Fang's work uh, at UC Berkeley uh, in the Center for the Built Environment that they have there. They've been doing a ton of research on radiant systems, um, and they have some great resources, as well as just um, if you really want to dive into it, uh, her dissertation's really great um, and, and gets into kind of some of the capacities and how these change, uh, particularly uh, when exposed to sun. Uh, traditional systems have a pretty flat line in terms of cooling capacity of how many watts per square meter you can get out of the space. But when, as soon as you have the sun hitting them, you know, that changes everything. Um, because we're speaking in terms of surface temperatures, not air temperatures. So your cooling capacity goes through the roof. So whereas traditionally, you know, your cooling capacity would be in the order of, um, oh, 10 to 20 watts per square meter, uh, as soon as you've got sunlight hitting a space, that can jump to a heat removal of 130 watts per square meter. Um, so if you're looking to implement your radiant system in just one small space, um, do it in a space with window. Um, that gets a lot of heat during the summer. Um, something else to know. And um, that's all that I have for you. So thank you very much. Um, and if you have any questions, um, we've got uh, 10 minutes. So. Yeah, Chris. I always floors, always the best, or do you put them in the ceiling for cooling, floor for heating, walls, or mm -hmm. uh, just your thoughts in general, cost, savings, just thoughts in general on um, thoughts in general, um, as an academic, I love the potential of slab systems. Um, we are in a predominantly heating climate, um, where, and you're going to get way better efficiency and capacity uh, using a floor system for heating uh, than, say, a ceiling panel, just because you're going to be heating your ground temperature, so you're going to get that natural convection and some air mixing so your fans can be a little bit smaller. Um, and so, so floor systems are great for heating. Ceiling systems, great for cooling because you've got this warm air rising. It hits this, um, it can be just like a metal panel with some copper tubing through there. It's going to hit that and then fall back down. Um, so you get, get some mixing there. Uh, you know, a chilled beam system 
uh, where you've got kind of your your HVAC ductwork lined up along with a radiant cooling system. So uh, you're you're passing your air over this radiant system. So it's a combination of convection and radiant cooling. Um, once again, your surface temperatures should be you know in the 60s. They're not super cold, so you shouldn't be worrying about condensation. But when you pair it with convection, uh, the the two work in concert um, because you don't need to provide as much fan work to bring that air down um, because it's naturally falling. Uh, so for cooling, um, ceiling panels are great, um, a much lower infrastructure cost. Um, in terms of payback periods, there was a, a DOE study um, that I've got cited earlier in this presentation. They found a payback period for a slab system in the four to six year time range. For a uh, chilled panel, chilled beam, they thought that was at cost. No, no payback period. It's cheaper to do that than rely on a traditional VAB system. Um, in terms of walls, uh, you can get this polypropylene matting, and it's just these like tubes that you stick straight on and then stucco in. Um, if, if, as long as you don't have movable walls, that might be okay. But I haven't seen them implemented as much. Definitely not in the states. More so in China. Um, here in the States, it's slabs, usually for heating, chilled panels for cooling. Um, but if you're going to have one or the other, uh, slabs, you know, are great in a heating climate, and you can then, you know, flip them over in the summer using for cooling. But you're not going to get as high of a capacity because you're going to get that cold air kind of settling down. It's not going to mix as much without a good, you know, dedicated outdoor air system. So. Yeah, Tim. A more depth on that. In this climate, if you're doing gradient slabs and then the outdoor air system, sometimes you can meet your cooling capacity with additional slab plus a little bit of DX cooling or something in that area. Um, yeah, you know, every building is going to be unique. Um, I, I haven't looked too much at, at specific capacities. I know um, at CSHQA, they size, they kind of double size their system as an insurance policy. So they have a radiant system that is sized to meet, I think, close to 80 to 90 percent of their total cooling needs. Um, they also have an air system that's sized to meet that same amount of need. Um, and part of that was just individual design changes that happened along the way. Um, but uh, Russ, uh, Russ has told me that, you know, it's it's tough to do everything based on a radiant slab system, um, but what it does is it offsets your your cooling capacity. So you might not be able to get 100% of the way there, um, but you're definitely going to downsize your plant equipment, and you can find a lot of savings through that just downsizing alone. Hello, um, for the trying to do is prevent your um, surface temperature from going through those wild swings. Um, and so you're just trying to keep kind of an even, even temperature. So those longer control period times are great. Um, so that way you don't come into the office and feel super cold on a 50 degree day. If you have your system kind of running consistently with uh, some time before people arrive and after people arrive, uh, you can definitely get your space kind of thermally ready for people to be in there. Um, so yeah, your, your air system can take care of a, a lot of the comfort during the shoulder seasons, um, but what your radiant system is really doing during those shoulder seasons is just keeping things even so that your building isn't going through these wild back and forth of, oh, I need a ton of heating, I need a ton of cooling. It should just be Generally, I just need a little bit of heating or a little bit of cooling to keep the surface temperature uh, about so. 
Um, so you're not fighting the structure of your building. Your building structure is kind of going through incremental changes um, so that your air system doesn't have to pound it quite as hard. Of course, you know, I'd love to get into predictive controls. That's, you know, where I'm hoping to head um, in terms of dissertation research. Um, but even just um, controlling based on outdoor temperature, you know, monitoring what season you're in, um, it's, it's amazing the, the small temperature changes within your slab have a huge impact on thermally. Um, you know, once again, it's that very dense medium and there's a lot of thermal energy trapped in that. So if you just take five degrees out of that, that makes a huge difference as opposed to trying to pound that with a, a huge air system, you know. So you run the risk of um, chilling with just domestic cold water when it's 55 degrees coming out of the ground? Yes. Um, yeah, so that'd be a great application for like water, water heat pump. Um, and, and some set point controls on that. What about um, cumulative heat? Um, like if you've got a multi-story building, um, mm -hmm. so you've got three stories, and that third story, does it really need a radiant floor up there because you're going to have these heats from below rising? Um, that's, a, that's a great question. Um, you know, I don't know off the top of my head. Um, I do know of a building that was in, <clears throat> excuse me, Edmonton, Canada, actually. Um, and if you have a minute afterwards, I can point you to the study, where they had a multi-story uh, building and they ran into those issues where the capacities were size the same, but it didn't necessarily need to be that way. Um, there's also a three-story building down in uh, San Francisco that the Center for the Built Environment has as kind of a case study um, that, that you could look at. I haven't looked too much into that though. Um, but in Edmonton, their, their main issue was they had the whole thing controlled the same and they had some spaces really close to windows and it gets very cold there. Um, and so they ended up just kind of wasting a lot of heat all night um, in some zones. And then during the daytime, others were getting solar gains into the space so the occupants were feeling quite hot while other floors still needed kind of some of that heating. So they, uh, decided they just needed a different control system rather than a different structure. So, so just, you know, breaking up the zones a little bit. You know, it just seems like you're saving costs if you don't even have to put it in that third yep. floor. Right. Um, I think that you want to read uh, like you mentioned that uh, the ground temperature has a great impact in the simulation results. Yes. Uh, I was wondering, like, say, do you, like, is that based on some construction saying the slab is in direct contact with the ground? Or, or I mean, why don't they put insulations above, uh, below this? So that kind of convention is, is distant. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, you want as much insulation below your slab as you can get, um, you know, R, R19 or better you know, some of that hard, hard foam. Um, and then on top of that foam, you lay your PEX tubing and then pour your concrete over that. Because what you really want to be doing is looking only at the surface above, you know, where, where the people are. Inevitably though, even with that insulation, you're going to have some thermal exchanges with the ground. So you want to minimize that as much as possible to decouple that. But in reality, you're still going to have some of those losses. And so that's, that's why there's the need to kind of add those extra elements to the modeling. Are energy management systems uh, made to handle the, the radiant chill slab and the air within and give you some uh, interface with the number of sensors you need and so on? Um, yeah, I, I mean, you can. Um, energy management systems, you know, they need different inputs and they provide, you know, the signals to your heat pumps, to, you know, all of your plant equipment. You just need to be talking to your plant equipment in the right language um, and just realize that air systems and radiant systems, uh, 
they speak different languages. So instead of controlling based on a thermostat, you need to control based on slab temperature, or ideally a lot of the academic studies use mean radiant temperature, where you've got this globe kind of thermostat uh, with a thermocouple in there. You don't see that too often, but that's kind of ideally how these systems are simulated. Um, so they, they can, um, but you definitely need to make sure that the controls contractor is aware of its particular needs and what kind of inputs you're going to need for this, that it can't just rely on a typical air thermostat. Yep. Um, I'm not sure about um, building code all that much. I can tell you that you can gain a significant amount of lead credits by pursuing a radiant system. There are a few different categories um, where you can get points in different categories all for using a, a radiant HVAC system. Um, codes, I'd have to rely on somebody else to answer that question. Anything else? All right. Well, thank you very much for coming. And thank you, Idaho Power. And um, look forward to seeing you at the next BSUG.